Thanks for making time out of your busy schedule to meet with me today. As a representative of the Board of Directors for the Flip and Fly Planel of Police, we are concerned that although we see record profits every even year, we also see a big dip during the odd years and we're concerned that we're going to see a lot less profits next year. So we decided to come meet with you and try to find out kind of the root of this problem. No problem, don't mention it. The CEO and founder of Flip and Fly Flannel and Fleece, where I founded this company during the flannel boom of the 90s. Oh, the 90s. Yeah, what a great time. We really need grunge to make a comeback. Agreed, agreed. But getting back to your question. In the flannel business, there's one truth. To demonstrate, look at the sales by size. Note which sizes are our best sellers. Uh, small and 2XL. Exactly. That's our hipster and lumberjack base. Those are the two groups who keep us in business. But notice during the even years, there's also a spike in normal shirt sizes. Please explain. Well, there's an election year every other year where thousands of out-of-touch rich guys run for various offices. And what is the one way that they can show that they're just like one of us? Oh, of course! They wear flannel shirts and all their ads to show that they're just like the normal people. Welcome to the Metal Cert Mike channel. Today I bring you the winner of the XM-17 Modular Handgun System competition for the U.S. Army and Air Force, the Sig Sauer P320 M17. Sig winning the $580 million contract came with some controversy, although the Breda M9 officially replacing the M1911 in 1990 also brought controversy, so perhaps this is par for the course. The Breda M9 was showing signs of being long in the tooth thanks to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and there's the age-old argument about the lack of stopping power with the 9mm ball ammo. Although the U.S. never signed the Hague Convention Agreement that banned the use of hollow-point ammunition, they've usually abided by it. Many special forces units use other pistols including the SIG P226, which is Beretta's main competition for the M9 contract, the SIG P228, the Glock 19, and variants of the M1911, the latter of which, which I did a review on, the Colt M45A1. Many infantry soldiers complain about the lack of features on the Beretta, namely the lack of a rail. The Marines adopted the Beretta M9A1 in 2006, which does have a rail. Other complaints included the open slide allowing debris in. The Air Force initiated the MHS program in 2008. The MHS program called for a non-caliber specific handgun with modular features to allow for different fire control devices, magazines, and grips. It needed to have rails and a non-reflective neutral color and can operate with the suppressor. The Army put in a request for information in 2013 to assess what handguns were out there. Beretta presented the M9A3, an updated M9A1 with a slimmer grip, sand-resistant magazines, threaded barrel, tritium night sights, a 1913 rail, and an FDE color. Beretta tried to convince the Army that the interchangeability of parts and magazines with the current M9s in service would produce massive cost savings. The Army decided not to evaluate the M9A3 and signed on to the MHS program. Although there are several entries, the most notable were what became the FN509 Tactical, the Glock 19X, and the SIG P320M17. On January 18, 2017, the SIG was announced as a winner of the contract to produce the M17 and M18 pistols. The 9mm version was chosen with the government purchasing the full metal jacket and special purpose ammo. Shortly after this, we all know about the drop test issues which had to be corrected, and many have thought that SIG won due to underbidding everyone else and not because they had the pis pistol. The same accusation was leveled against Beretta in the 1980s. Glock and Steyr even tried to sue, although it was thrown out before it could go to court. One of the requirements of the MHS was that it had to be a gun sold on the civilian market and the M17 is basically a P320 with a manual safety. You can buy the regular M17, which is what I have today, 
or a commemorative version of which they only made 5,000. The main difference is all the controls on the commemorative version are in FDE instead of black, and the package runs you over $1,500. I opted for the regular M17 as I didn't want to spend that kind of money on the commemorative version, and I actually wanted to shoot it. When I took it out, I brought my M9, M9A3, and Glock 19X to compare it to. I've already reviewed the 19X and the M9A3 on the channel, but I wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison. Now you've heard of my glowing review of the 19X and know of my love for my Berettas, so the SIG would have to really blow me away. It isn't a bad gun to shoot, and I'm sure I could come to like it if I shoot it more. It seems fairly well balanced, and is much lighter than the Berettas, but I'll have to say that I think they chose the wrong gun. When it comes to flat-out shooting, the M9A3 is the most accurate of the four pistols I mentioned, but for an overall package such as carrying it, I think the Glock 19X is the superior pistol. As I said earlier, cost was certainly a consideration, but we need to make sure we are getting the best pistol in the hands of our military, especially those who have to do house-to-house -house fighting. The SIG will probably suffice in the long run, but it's hard to ignore the Glock's record of reliability. If you're watching this video in the autumn of 2018, please check out my SKS giveaway to help out CMAX family. Uh, CMAX unfortunately passed away here a couple weeks ago. Please be aware of where those you support stand on the Second Amendment. Please join the GOA in your state's organizations. If you like what you see, check out my other videos, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and who I support on Patreon. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day. But I was like, man.